Okay, so my topic today is add SM2 in Substrate for transaction signing. And uh, SM2 is just a, a kind of elliptic curve. And uh, uh, before I start, I'm going to do a little introduction about myself. I work in parity as uh, a software uh, a engineer and um, more, like more specifically, uh, a dev advocate. My daily work is to, my daily work is to, like to make Substrate adopted more widely and I'm not major in mathematics, but I think these elliptic curves, they do play a role in security industry, uh, especially in the blockchain. So basically, uh, I, I research on like the NFT protocol and the daily job is dev advocate. And I used to be an Ethereum dev advocate, uh, dev de development and now I am do some development on Substrate. Okay, here is my disclaimer that I'm not a cryptographer and I'm totally new to the like to the all crypto things. Uh, the reason that why I want to like to add a new signing algorithm in Substrate is like uh, like I don't know anything about the crypt cryptography and uh, and I know a little about the substrate so i just want to test the capability of substrate modular and uh, i'm gonna like i just want to see that uh, how modular a substrate can be uh, so uh, a little like warm warning that this talk might be useless and uh, basically i start all the ellipse curve th uh, the elliptic curve things uh, with a few articles and uh, here i'm gonna do many thanks to andrew Koblenis, like gentle introduction to elliptic curve so today we're gonna talk about like a brief introduction of elliptic curve crypto system and uh, uh, what is sm2 and uh, uh, sub substrate and i suppose uh, you all familiar with and how to add a new signing algorithm in Substrate. And uh, last, we're gonna like to test uh, using the sub Substrate sub XT to test the, the whole thing's work. Before ECC, I'm gonna like talk about some like very basics about the ellipse curve. Like, Ellipse curve is kind of complicated, but the way you use them is pretty simple. Uh, basically, you just use the mathematical abstraction like the public key, the private key. So the uh, uh, ECC is a member of the public key crypto system. Uh, so what is a public key crypto system? And I think it's a type of cryptography and uh, an algorithm. And in the public key crypto system, you've got a private key and a public key. You, you, and you use the private key to encrypt a data and then decrypt it with the public key. And before we really get to uh, the details of the elliptic curve, we are gonna talk about the trapdoor function, which is a math function that underpins the whole public key crypto system. Here, if we start with A and uh, we can easily get to uh, another value B using the trapdoor function. Uh, going one way, like from A to B, is very, very easy. But then if you start with A and you want to go get back to the value A, and uh, it's very difficult to do that or impossible to do that. So basically, a trapdoor function is a function that is easy to go to one direction, but very hard to go to the other direction. So this kind of, so this is kind of the foundation of the uh, public key crypto system. Uh, one algorithm that is commonly used, you, you may heard about that is RSA. And what is RSA? RSA is based uh, factorization and where you take two random prime numbers and you multiply them together and you will get a really big prime number. As the issue that the multiplication is easy, which is like kind of that uh, A to B, but then to factor those out coming back from A B to A is very difficult. 
uh, it, this is a very like fun, fundamental of RSA today. Uh, so, uh, so the R, so the RSA is very like the trapdoor function. And here comes the question: If RSA works so well today, and uh, then why we need uh, the uh, some? Uh, I put the table here, and you can see that. You can see that from the key size, if we want to achieve the same level of security and uh, uh, the RSA key size is 3072, while the ECC key size is to 256 bytes. And if we bump this up, uh, if we bump this up to like to 7680 of ISA key size, it will be 384 bytes of key size in ECC. So as you can see, ECC is much more efficient uh, than the RSA, and the key size is much smaller, while it can uh, still achieve the same level of security. So that, now yeah, you may wonder. Question for you: Are the I know like in Substrate before you modify it, like you're going to show us today, it supports a couple different signing algorithms like uh, SR two five five one nine and ED two five five one nine. And are those yeah. are those both elliptic curve crypto systems? Uh, yeah. What? what I can you say that again. Yeah, yeah. So the the signing algorithms that come with Substrate, like I know you're going to add SM2 today, which is uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. My question is, do the ones that already come with Substrate, like the ED25519 and the SR, are those also elliptic curve systems, just like different ones, or are they not even elliptic curve? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah, cool. it's a yeah, it's a different one. Cool. Uh, so. Okay, so here is we are gonna talk about some in the, some brief introduction about the ellipse curve cryptography, and I'm not an expert in it, but I will try my best, like to get this as simple as possible. So now, uh, like you, you you may wonder what is ECC and how does it work and what's the magic behind the curtain. So basically speaking, an ellipse curve is a set of points defined by the uh, equation. Uh, y squared equal, uh, equals x cubed plus a times x plus b. So the, so the ellipse curve has a few interesting characteristics. As you can see that the first one is this curve is symmetric about the x-axis. So here is, here is the x-axis and uh, uh, this is uh, like the same on the top and it's like the mirror image. And the other thing is that if you draw a straight line through the curve, it will intersect the curve with no more than three points. So if we take a point G and draw a line through it, it will, it will hit a couple of points on the curve in this case. And uh, like if we draw a line through G and uh, it will hit the curve at B, a point B and uh, C. So on the right, on the right of the slide, we can see that if we set the different value of the parameters A and B, we will get uh, the curves with different shapes, but all of them are symmetric about uh, the x-axis. You can see that the B equals one and the A varies from two to minus three. Okay, and uh, Next, we're gonna go further, like we're gonna talk about the group operation. And uh, this will like seem wired to those who are not familiar with the ellipse curve. And uh, I think let's just ignore all the mathematical part because we're not gonna dig deeper here today. There is like a big theory behind this and let's see it's kind of a, uh, a, a advanced math. So, we could always define the third point p plus q on the curve. Uh, so here are some basic laws about, uh, about the group operation. And the one is that if a and b are members of the group g and, and uh, then uh, a plus b and is also a member 
uh, a member of G. And uh, here we defined what is the point zero. Point zero is a point at infinity. And, uh, the, and also the definition of the inverse of a point B. And uh, uh, the inverse of, uh, of the point is the one that symmetric about the axis is uh, like the R and the minus R. So we're gonna like to, we're gonna like study the group operation with the, uh, with the, the addition. So uh, here is the definition of the addition that's giving three aligned non-data points, uh, P and Q and R, and their sum is zero uh, if they are on the same line. So here are some special cases. Uh, and one is, and uh, one is if P equals zero or Q equals zero. So the equation what looks like P plus zero equals P or Q plus zero equals Q. It looks like a sort of nature to us. So, and uh, second, the other case is uh, P equals minus Q. So the equation what looks like uh, P plus minus P equals zero as what we defined in the last slide. And zero is the point at infinity. So the minus P is called the inverse of P, which is, which is a symmetric point about the X axis of P. So geometrically, it will be uh, a vertical line, which uh, intersects the curve at P and minus P. And the third one is if, if P equals Q. And this will be interesting because the sum of P and Q will be two times P. And uh, this is an operation called double in ACC calculation. And also geometrically, uh, the, like, like here is, a, here is a, a little GIF about uh, the, uh, the double the, the double operation that uh, there is a unique line that touches a curve and it doesn't go through it and uh, it's called a tangent line to the curve at p so it also uh, intersects the curve with another point and we do a critical line through the second point and uh, we could find the point p plus p which is symmetric uh, of the second point uh, like uh, like I uh, like uh, what's on the right bottom, the P plus P point. So uh, the same cases, so the same as the case P plus P, we would draw a line through the P here and the double P on the right bottom, and we will get a point in, we will get a point intersected with the curve, that's the R, and against, let's do a quick, uh, a critical line through the point R and we get this three times P. So if we like to repeat this, to repeat this operation, we, we will get like, uh, uh, like Q equals two P, Q equals three P and you will find with this method, here we surprisingly find that ourselves to, could do some multiplication. We could multiply points by any integer. So this is the multiplication rules in the group operation. And we just deduct it from the uh, addition rule. I, I have another question, Maggie. The, uh, this GIF is really cool. I, I, so the, yeah. idea, like, the idea is that GIF shows how to add a point to itself, I guess, right? And like, you yeah. just take the yeah. limit as like, imagine it's two different points. And then as they get closer and closer, you can see the tangent line and everything. So uh, yeah. So the sum, I guess my question is like, the sum of P plus P, you're saying it's that point down on the bottom half, right? Not on the top where the yellow line intersects the gray line? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, cause as we see that, because we see that it, you can see the general addition definition, like giving the three uh, aligned. So mm -hmm. the P plus R, the P plus R plus Q equals zero, right? Mm -hmm. So in this situation, it would be the P plus P plus, maybe call this two uh, R equals mm -hmm. zero. So P plus P equals minus R and, uh, and the minus R is two P. 
Okay, I see. Oh, so, okay, I think I missed something earlier. Like, the rule whenever you add two points is, like, you draw the line that goes through them, you find that third point, and then the sum is, like, you flip it over, and that's the sum. It's not, like, the three that are on the same line. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, cool. You will find, yeah, you will find uh, the three points, the, uh, the line that inter uh, intersect with the curve, and uh, the three point and the sum of this three point uh, equals to zero. Yeah. Okay. So that is see that the P plus Q equals the minus R, right? Okay. Yeah, I missed that the first time. So in this figure, P plus Q <laughs> minus R. Perfect. Yeah, thank you. Okay, cool. And uh, here is like, here is I how... Have, oh, I have okay. a question too, Maggie. Uh, all of these operations are uh, modulo, modulo some integer. Mm, Am I mm, right? Mm, yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, and we were like, uh, here we don't have some like uh, the modular integer, and we will like talk about the finite field uh, late and uh, later. And I believe, uh, yeah, I believe here is uh, what you mean uh, the modular integer, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the ECC is based on on the modular arithmetic on elliptic curves. Yeah, you yeah. couldn't build one without the model or modular part. Yeah. Okay, cool, thanks. Okay. So here's a way that how we like how we do the multiplication and uh, how we like deduct the multiplication uh, through the, the addition. And, uh, okay. And could you say when we should use uh, the, the given use cases? There is some the, rule or application when we, we, we should use, for example, uh, double or multiply uh, or, or... Oh, okay, okay, I know. Oh, uh, okay. So speaking of the use cases, and uh, I highly recommend you like to read the article and uh, it's, it's, what, it's what that... Uh, uh, I highly rec recommend to you to search the Andrew uh, Koblenis gentle introduction to ECC. Uh, mm -hmm. It will tell you that with a double, uh, like with addition, with a double operation, it's really simple. Like it's really um, simple to calculate uh, the multiplication. Okay, thank you. Okay, so here we're gonna continue like like before. Uh, okay, and here is a finite field. And uh, uh, here is what I am not that familiar with. And uh, I just, uh, I can, like, like, I cannot explain it like uh, too much specific, but I can, but I kind of know the a general idea behind it. And the finite field is, uh, is a integer that's the modular P. So, uh, so basically speaking, the P is the finite field. So here we like, we show some operations with a, uh, in the uh, with the mod with the modular p and it's quite I think it's easy to understand. It's like you do some calculation on a clock base. So here's the addition that is so it's uh, twenty seven mod twenty three is four and the subtraction, and I think it's quite easy to understand. It's just uh, some simple modular operation. Okay, and uh, so here is a, a yeah additive inverse and uh, multiplicative inverse. Okay, and here is a definition of the division modular p and find the uh, and it's just to find the uh, multiplicative inverse of a number and then perform a single uh, multiplication. And uh, I'm gonna I'm not gonna like like uh, to elaborate more on this if you are interested i highly suggest you to read the article i just recommend you like a gentle introduction to it here yeah, we're gonna an article in the chat for anyone who wants it oh okay okay i'm gonna i, I nice put it idea. there already so anyone can find it yeah oh okay okay cool and uh 
Then we are going to talk about the private number. Uh, so, like after we have uh, gone through the the modular operation, and let's just go back to the addition. And the point here is whatever we do with p, like the p plus p, p, and the result seems a bit like we were moving around a clock face, seemingly at random. So we can not, uh, so we cannot predict it. And we know it will always intersect the curve with one more point, like not three or two points. So definitely we're going to get a, cer a certain point. So now if I give you a point like on the curve, you can see I say the question, <clears throat> the, que the question mark P, right? And how many, how many times of the P is that? Uh, I've got no idea. It could be like 50p or 5 billion p, and there's no way of knowing that. Uh, there is no way of knowing that. This is, this this is uh, like the question mark is our pri uh, private number, and uh, that's a thing we cannot extract back out here. So I think here is the key of the the ECC. And so, and uh, the picture on the, on the right top is uh, what it looks like um, an ECC on a finite field. So every point, like er, er, uh, every point on the ECC is just a, 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 a integer. So I think the complete, the complete is expression of ECC is uh, y squared equals uh, x cubed plus a times x cubed uh, plus a times x plus b mod and modular p. And uh, so on the picture on the right, on the right, uh, right, right top, uh, here's the uh, p equals, equals uh, 28. So now we're gonna get to uh, and uh, so I think uh, if we like if we defined a finite field P and all the value of x and y are taken from uh, zero to P minus one. So what is and here we're gonna talk about where, what is private key and the public key geometrically. If we pick a point G on the curve, uh, we see uh, use a random number to times G and we will get an, another point on the curve. And the random number with the question mark. And uh, so the question mark, it means the, the private key and uh, uh, and the question mark times g, and it's a, it's a point on the curve, and which is our public key. And uh, you can see from what we like we demonstrated before that uh, if we don't know if we if we don't know the value of the question mark, it is impossible for like if we only know the point on the curve and without knowing the question mark's value, and it's in, and it's impossible. Like to like to deduct the uh, uh, what is the question mark from this point? So uh, let me make sure I understand this. I think I I think I get it. So we choose uh, like if I want to use this system, I choose a private key. Um, just like myself, I keep it private, and everybody else who's using the system and me, like we all agree on a base point G. Like everybody knows G. I think right? It's public. Yeah. Okay. And so then once I've chosen my own private key, then it's easy to, for me to make this calculation. Like I just multiply the question mark in the G the way you told us before, and that's my public key. And then it's safe. Oh, yeah, yeah. My public key away. Like, I mean, obviously I don't want you to know my private key, but I can still tell you my public key because it's hard for you, even if you know my public key and the base point G to go backwards and extract the private key. Is that basically the idea? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's totally right. Yeah, it, it, uh, exactly. 
Uh, so here, uh, so uh, as George said, that's the uh, base point G is public, and it's kind of one of the property of the elliptic curve, and everyone knows what is the base point G. And so uh, I'm gonna like elaborate more on what is a base point, as what as what we mentioned in the last slide. If we pick a point on the curve, let's say the point P, and uh, there is a extra feature of the multiplication of the points on the ellipse curve. So uh, let's go back to the last slide. You can see that if we like random choose a number, uh, a point P on the curve, that uh, you will see uh, like if we do some uh, multiplication, like zero P is, is zero and one P and uh, it's the Y, uh, the value of x and y coordinate, and it's uh, uh, three six, and it's a, and three p is eighty, is eighty eighty seven, and four p is three ninety one. And here is a here is the interesting things. And uh, the five p and the five p equals zero p, and then the six times p equals one p and eight times p equals two times p and uh, so the, re the result of the multiplication will be would repeat cyclically so if we choose a random point p on the curve as a base point and uh, this point happens to be uh, if this point happens to be a bad point there might be only five points without all the multiplication with p like these five points are closed under the addition so in this situation even others have no idea about what is my private key but uh but based on there are only five choices for them so only they need to do is to guess at most five times and they will get my private key so if we like if we choose like if we like choose if we have a good base point and uh, and uh, and uh, i think uh, if someone else maybe some bad person want to get our private key they need to try a lot, maybe 10 billion times or 10 trillion times uh, so it's important to have a great base point uh, but uh but I've got no idea that how we choose uh, a base, base point. So it's kind of a property of the elliptic curve. Okay, here, okay, here is the end of the introduction of an elliptic curve. We're going to talk about what is SM2. And SM2 is a short for Chinese standard crypto algorithm it's very similar with the ECDSA, which is like commonly used in uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum. Here we can see that here is the domain parameters of the ECC and uh, that specifies the size of the finite field and, uh, and A and A and B, A and B is uh, uh, and a and B is here, is here A and B in the formula. And the G is the base point we just talked about. And uh, the N is the order subgroup. And uh, it's just uh, some, like some mathematical meaning and uh, we don't need to care about them now. Uh, so here is the, here is a specific value about all the domain parameters of the ECDSA because uh, the A equals zero. So the formula for ECDSA is Y squared equals X cubed plus B. And here is the base point X, G, Y, G of ECDSA and N at A and H and, and also with the P, uh, the finite field. And uh, and uh, here is the uh, domain parameters, the value of uh, domain parameters of the SM2. And the, and the formula also looks like so y, y squared equals x cubed plus uh, a times x plus b. Uh, so, so basically speaking, the S, uh, 
uh, SM2 and the, and the ECDSA, they shared the same form of formula, but with like the different value of the domain parameters. So they are very alike. Before the code review, and I'm gonna tell about that how how uh, how I did this like integrate SM2 in Substrate. And the first, cause I'm not a cryptographer, find a SM2 lib, and then uh, I just go through the SM2 lib and understand the most important types, like uh, the private key. Like the key size is 32 bytes, and public key and the like the compressed public key is uh, 30, 33 bytes, and the full and the uh, full public key is 65 bytes, and the length of the signature is 64 bytes. It's very like uh, the ECDSA, and then understand the signing process, and I will explain find all the types in substrate and most important like after i implement the tree pair i think the like the new signing algorithm will work like we'll work with substrate and the tree pair is the most important if you want like to add a new signing algorithm in substrate uh so good, here good, is uh question okay what are the advantages of using SM2 versus ECDSA? Uh, that's a great question. Because as I know, like there's no difference but, like with SM2 and the ECDSA. Uh, like uh, as I know, if you want to develop some blockchain in China and you are only allowed to use the Chinese standard crypto algorithm like SM2, I believe like if you want to develop some consortium chain in other countries and you will adapt their own standard of crypto system. Yeah, Hernando, I, I was when I was sort of uh, prepping for this with Maggie, I, I had never heard of SM2 except from her. And, um, you know, so I looked it up and I, I found this Stack Overflow article that I just pasted into the chat and like, it seemed like the answer was basically like, there's no real technical advantages to using this one or that one. It's just that SM2 got standardized in China. And so like, if you wanna make it easy for Chinese people to use a lot of tools that they already know and are familiar with and everything, like then you might wanna use SM2 grip. Exactly. But like, if you want to like develop or some consortium chain, permission chain uh, in some specific country, I know that the uh, Germany has their own standard, own crypto standard, and you and uh, the European, the US, and they all have their like own own standard about the crypto things. And I think it's useful to realize too, like although Maggie's teaching us specifically about SM2 today, like the technique she's showing us is not really limited to SM2. Like if you have some other crypto algorithm that you want to include in substrate, like, or I think, is this even right, Maggie? I think like you can do the same steps you're showing us here with like whatever crypto library you want to use. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to like to, uh, to demonstrate my, like my process is how to integrate SM2 in substrate and if you, I heard, I hope that after you heard what I did in, uh, in SM2 with Substrate, and I hope that you can like to integrate your own like crypto algorithm in Substrate. And only you need to do is to implement the trick pair in Substrate. Okay, so here is a signing process with ECDSA and you got a raw message and then you use some hash function and you get a hashed message is, uh, th is 32 by. And then you put this hashed message into the ECDSA sign function and with your secret key, your private key. And then you get a signature. And from the signature, you can, re you can recover uh, your public key uh, from the signature. And, uh, but with the uh, SM2, it's a bit more complicated because like this doesn't matter. It's just uh, some like 
like some manual rules, I think is defined by some maybe Chinese government. And uh, th this XJYG is a base point of the uh, ellipse curve and, X and XYA is a, co is a coordinate of your public key. So, th so this is the A and B domain parameters and this is a base point and this is your, pub your public key. And you, this, this is some identifier and you put, you put all of this together and SM3 is like a hash function, like you hash all the things and then you get a ZA and, and you put together ZA with a message and do the hash function again. And then you get a result and use a, a secret key, you use a private key and uh, to do the SM2 signing function to get the signature. And the whole process is kind of complicated, but not, but not important. Uh, but one thing that the SM2 is different from the ECDSA is you cannot like to recover the public key from the signature. I have a question about that. So the idea okay. of recovery is like if you use a crypto system where you can do recover, like apparently ECDSA, like I could send you a message and I could send you like literally just the signature. And from that signature, you could extract my public key, I guess, right? So yeah, did yeah, that, that's the ECDSA. That lead to any problems in Substrate? Does it mean you have to like send along a public key with every signature, or how, or that really just? Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. That's yeah, that's the point. I will talk about in the uh, in the code review, and uh, I think this is uh, this is maybe it's uh, only one difference between between the ECDSA and. Uh, uh, ECDSA and uh, and the SM2. So, uh, so you can see that from the fol from the folder, it's basically the substrate node uh, node template. I just add a folder called uh, primitives SM2 in it, and uh, so you can see from the cargo, I just I just uh, uh, import some SM2 library and thanks to the SATA team and they have like already done a a a rest uh a rest implement of uh, the sm2 so i just use them and uh, do some wrapper okay so i uh, so in the so in the sm2 what i did in the, uh sm2 is i defined find some important type here like the seed it's like the uh, it's very like the, uh, a private key and uh, it's uh, third, 32 bytes long and the public key and the com and the compressed one is 33 bytes and then I think I just defined uh, and also like define the seed and the public key and implement and uh, implement the public key with uh, some necessary treat like uh, the odd and the equal, and uh, also with some like uh, some R tier function. Oh, and also this is important. You must implement the treat public uh, for for the for the public uh, type you defined in your code. And uh, okay, and here. Is uh, strap is uh, the strap pair I defined here. So the pub key and the secret key is just uh, I take from the uh, from the libsm like like from the sm2 de dependency. So and the more and the most important is here. Like you must implement the pair treat and for the pair you defined in your in your code and. Uh, it includes some some functions like uh, generate with freeze or uh, from freeze, derive, and most important is, I think, uh, this is like to uh, create a new key pair from the secret seed, and uh, here's the same. And most important, you tend you need to like to to implement the sign function and the verify function. And this too, I think is most important. And speaking of the other function, you can just, you can just copy some, 
I think you can you can just copy some code from the e ECDSA part uh, in the substrate. So here, and uh, I'm gonna answer Josh's question. Yeah, so here, uh, the signature in the ECDSA is 64 bytes long, but the signature here is 97 bytes. So speaking of say 97 bytes, and it's basically is uh, the origin 64 bytes signature, signature plus uh, the 33 bytes public key. So cause, cause we cannot like to uh, recover the public key from the signature. So uh, if we want to, uh, so if we like to uh, pass the signature to the substrate node, we need to like to append the origin signature with the 33 bytes public key. Does it make sense, Joshi? Yeah, totally. That and is, yeah, that's exactly what I was wondering. Thanks. So you had to because SM2 doesn't have this feature built in where you can recover the public key. You had to sort of like manually implement that the way you showed us here. Yeah. 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 Cool. Makes a lot of sense. Ah. Okay. Is, uh, there, so, is there a check digit on that? Because uh, uh, on what? the thirty-three byte <laughs> public key, normally it's. 32 bytes or unless ah. oh okay uh so the uh, like i think technically the public key is 32 bytes alone but you need to add some prefix like to uh uh you need to add some prefix before the origin public key and if like if the public key is 32 bytes and you need to add i think two or three as a pre as a prefix uh, so, and if the public key is 64 bytes and you need to add, I think, four or five as prefix, like before the origin public key. So, so the length of the public key will be 33 or 65. Okay, so here, like uh, the signature, the way we defined, uh, the type signature is the only is the only difference. It's the only difference with the ECDSA part. And speaking of the other parts, I think you can just uh, uh, copy some code from the ECDSA part and uh, like to modify some lens here, like like for the ECDSA signature and the lens is 64. And here you're just gonna like to modify the 64 into the 97. It, I think it's quite simple. Because the SM2 is very like the ECDSA part. Here is the problem I met is cause uh, the library, I believe that this problem, uh, most of you will also come across that if you want to like, like directly use some like a uh, library, especially some crypto li li uh, library, and I think it's all implement in the uh, STD Rust, right? And uh, I believe none of them will be uh, will be compatible with no STD. So when I first find when I first find there are some library about SM2, and my uh, my biggest like my biggest concern is can I use it di directly? Because it only implement in STD. Uh, but later. Uh, so I I wanted I wanted to like to modify the whole to rewrite the whole libsm that into no std but uh, I just given up later because it's too too hard and uh, later I find there is a magic in substrate it's called the runtime interface macro and uh, the runtime interface and uh, it's complicated to to elaborate on this interface. I'm just gonna show you uh, what this what the what this macro can do in Substrate. So the runtime interface, basically speaking, if like 
as you know, the whole runtime in Substrate, uh, they run like uh, they are written in a no STD and, and run in a no STD environment. And, uh, and if you want to use some function from the STD environment, and uh, you can wrap the, uh, uh, the function like the SM2 uh, with the runtime interface. So runtime interface is like you plug a hole uh, uh, onto the NoSD environment and it allowed you to use the function uh, from the STTD directly. So this kind solve my problem with the integration uh, with, with SM2. Uh, I, just, uh, I just need to like to add the runtime interface macro here and uh, um, to define maybe define a trait, whatever the, the trait name says, and define the, the function I need like to SM2 verify a function because you know that you like you send a signature on on the chain and uh, after the chain got the signature and it will like it will call your verify your verify function in SM2 to verify if the signature is valid or not so that is where uh that is where we need we need to like to call the uh the verify function in sm2 like but it but it is implemented in a std so this is like uh uh a magic for me that enables me to like call a std uh function through through the no std environment so Maggie, this is really cool. I've never worked with runtime interfaces before, and I definitely get the concept. Nice slide for that. So my question is, now that you've written this trait here, did you have to implement this trait for your node or something? Or like, how did you wire this up into your system? Uh, OK, OK. And uh, I believe here is a, um, let me see. Uh, sorry. Ah, here. Here is the the things we need to add because like we need to like here is uh, is our native executor instance is a macro native executor instance and uh, if you find uh, if if you go to look uh, the code in no template and uh, this will be omitted so like if you implement your own REST interface function or treat and uh, please remember to add your custom runtime interface here. And uh, Am I right that this means that the, uh, um, the consensus, the upgradable consensus, you couldn't upgrade the SM2 implementation by voting for a new Wasm blob on chain? Uh, because I, it's not part of the Wasm blob because it's, it's compiled in STD. Emma, is this yeah. correct? Uh, I think I think if you like if you do if you do some votes on chain and uh, but it do, it doesn't work if you only upgrade like the 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 runtime code like the Watson blob. Mm. Uh, you will also need to like to replace you uh, to re replace like your 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 your, your uh, your being with a new one. Right. I need. I need a new. I need to restart my node with a new yeah. native. Yeah. Yes. Got it. Yes. Cool. Okay. So. Like, just to ask a little bit more about that line you're showing. What What did it say on line twenty before you added that SM two thing? Was it just like the the unit, like the empty parentheses, or what went there? Uh, you mean this word? Yeah. Uh, you you mean this type of code? Uh, actually, I don't know. <laughs> oh yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Actually, I think you need to like to to look the details about the native executor instance macro, and you will need and you will understand what this uh what this means in in in, in the whole con context. Uh. I yeah, think I just go to some GitHub issues 
and uh, or PRs and uh, C and uh, and, uh, and uh, um kind of forget. I, and I just need and I, I I just knew that if you like implement a a custom runtime interface and you need to like to manually add this line of code here. Yeah, cool. Makes sense. Okay, and so here is our uh, definition, a uh, redefinition of the uh, SM2 algorithm. And here is the runtime interface, and that that enable us like to call the STD function through uh, no STD environment. And uh, here, and uh, and here. And here, like, it's part of the code in the substrate. And you can see that the multi-signature, it includes the ED and SR and ECDSA. And we just uh, add the SM2 uh, signature here. And uh, also the multi-signer at an, at an SM2. So uh, this multi-signature and multi-signer is totally compatible uh, with the substrate original one. Yeah, I believe in the runtime. Uh, in the uh, yeah, in the and uh, yeah, and in the runtime, we just need to like to our new multi signature, and then and then replace it. Uh, with the type signature here. And uh, so I think the, uh, the whole node will use the new defined, the multi. Uh, okay, it's a runtime signature. And uh, here is, oh, here is uh, the public key. You can see that from the public key to the account ID, account ID 32, it is exactly the same as the ECDSA. And uh, the other detail I need to bring up is the verify function. So the ECDSA, and you can use uh, you you can use the function that recover. Uh, Recover and you will, uh, and 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 it will, uh, get it will get the public key from the signature, and you just need to and after you get the right the public key and you just need to hash the public key and to see if that equals to the account ID thirty two, but with SM two that you cannot you cannot recover the public key from the signature. So first. So first, you need to like to uh, to 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 get the the public key uh, from the signature. It's the last thirty three bytes of the of the signature, and then like uh, to use uh, to use the verify function in the SM two, and you need to like to put uh, the pub the public key from the signature and into into this verify function, and to see and to see if if it passes the verification. One thing that I thought was really cool about this code when I was reading through it, like obviously you've written a lot of code here in this SM2 crate that you're showing us, but I thought it was really cool that the modifications you made to the node template itself were like really minimal, like only a handful of lines. And that was like kind of your point about substrate being pretty modular. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so my sharing t today is not about like I wanted to introduce you uh, a new crypto al algorithm, and I want to like to show some mathematical things about the ellipse curve. And because uh, I'm also new to the to the quick to the crypto things, and what what I want to show today is is the capability. Uh, is popular capability. It almost enable everyone to like to implement what they want to do with Substrate. Okay, I'm gonna start the node. So it it looks it looks great now, and uh, here is another question that uh, how we how we can know that if if our 
if our like new implementation about the 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 SM2 integration is successful or not. Because uh, now the Pock.js does not support the S SM2 algorithm, so we cannot like to start a, a Pock.js uh, node and uh, and to like to do some operations in the Pock.js. Uh, uh, so here we're gonna introduce you a new tool. It's called a substrate substrate sub xt, and I can I think I can show you. Okay, so here is the substrate sub xt, and it's a library that you can submit extrinsic to a sub uh, uh, a substrate node by RPC. That if you're not familiar with the uh, the JavaScript. And like me, I'm like like I don't know anything about the JS, so I can like I can just mod modify the sub the sub XT to send uh uh to sign uh to send an extrinsic to the substrate running uh run, running node. So here, so here, like in my substrate SM two, I just. Uh, I cloned like under the RTL folder. I just cloned uh, the sub XT, put it as a as a dependency, but cloned it is that is is that I need like when I write my code here, like I need to I need to import the Kusama runtime uh, into my code, and and uh, if I just import uh, the the sub xt and like if the like if the sub xt and my substrate uh, node template it like substrate and it would corrupt so so i need to like to clone the whole substrate project in my project and uh, so the the so their dependency uh, of substrate version will be the same so here the signer, the signer is a pair. It includes the secret key and the public key. And here's a test. And they are all like to deductive from the SM2 algorithm. And here's a client, I believe is a connection uh, that you start a, a connection with your running substrate node and uh, to submit and, and in the submit, and, and you, you can you can just copy all this you can just copy all the all the all this code and only to modify is so uh, it seems uh in from the signer to the desk so i just uh, uh so i just uh, type in the balance transfer function in the submit and okay and uh, most important that uh here i want to uh transfer like to transfer some balance from the signer to the desk so i need to so in the chain speak oh so in the chain speak i need to give i need to like uh to in the in the genesis, in the in the genesis, I need to give some balance to 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 the signer. So here, so so here, I give some like uh, some balances in this. In the sub xt, okay. Here is my function. So here, I transfer some balance from the signer to the desk, and uh, so if if it worked and the and uh, it will show the balance tra transfer success value and in the console so let's just uh, uh okay let's just do the test okay first i'm now i'm already under the rto fol folder so i just uh, type toggle run release and you can see that Uh, still waiting. 
I have a question while we're waiting, or actually, I just have a couple thoughts I want to share. Like I, I got up this morning and I was really excited about this project and I just started hacking around on it. And so I, I have a few questions. One is um, like, what's up with using the Kusama runtime? Because this is not actually on Kusama, right? This is on your node template. So yeah, is it uh, yeah. close enough that it works or something or? Yeah. Oh, you, yeah, yeah. It's uh, like, uh, it, I think it is called the Kusama runtime in the sub XT, but it actually means it's a, it's a node template runtime. Because if we see, if we click the Kusama, Kusama runtime, you can see that we only implement the system and the balances module, like like the, the, the trait for uh, for Kusama runtime. So so basically here, I'm only allowed to call the functions uh, under the balances under the balances mo module here. Like if like if we like if I want to call some function from the staking. Our recovery and uh, uh, the Kusama runtime here uh, does not work. This is cool. I did not see this part of the code, but it almost reminds me of when you're like writing a test mock for your palette. You have to just like impl a few of these traits for like whatever test runtime. So this this makes sense. Oh, I see. They have default node runtime also. Yeah. Okay. So like if we needed to, like you didn't need to in this case, but if we needed to, if we had some like really custom weird chain, we could just make our own like pub struct Joshi's weird chain or whatever. Oh, yeah. Use that. Yeah, 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 okay, cool. yeah. Yeah, so Kusama is just an example, right? Yeah, Kusama runtime is just an example. I believe here it just means the no template runtime. And uh, if you wanted to, to test some uh, custom function from your own frame, or your, or, 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 or your own runtime, I think you need to implement uh, your custom runtime here. Um, I had, a, well, actually it's done, maybe you should show the demo and then I have another question afterwards too. <laughs> oh, okay, so so the result is here and uh, uh, in the con on the console we, we can see that the, re the result the balance transfer successful value and ten thousand. So that means the whole pro the whole process, uh, it 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 works well. So that's the whole process. That how you can test your custom, uh, your custom function or your customization uh, about the substrate. So how if you cannot do it with the Polkadot JS, huh? What? How many tokens did that test account start with? I forget what you put in your chain spec. Uh, how many tokens? I'm not sure. I I believe. I believe it's a. Oh, yeah, same as all of them. Like a, I think it's like a just a huge number of tokens. I was gonna yeah, ask. Yeah, yeah. Can we submit that transaction enough times, and then it starts failing because they run out of tokens. But I think maybe it would take too many tries before they run. Yeah, out. yeah. I yeah. I believe it's a very big number. Yeah. Cool. Okay. And then the the other thing I was thinking about is. Um, I know that here in your chain spec, like, yes, we're using SM2 and you added that, but all the old cryptos that were there before still work. Like you can even see we're funding Alice and Bob, like with their SR keys. Um, oh, yeah. I even checked, like I opened up Polkadot.js apps. And as you mentioned, like I can't use those SM2 accounts there, but I could still do normal stuff like transfer from Alice to Bob and that all worked. And so what uh, I was yeah. wondering- Yeah, of course. Yeah, cool. So I was wondering like, is it possible, can we modify what you did in sub XT so that we like send some tokens from this test account to like Alice's SR25519 account? Uh, but I, oh. I, like, I think probably we can somehow, but I couldn't quite figure out how to create Alice's like key or address or whatever it needed. Uh, I believe, okay, okay. It's, a, it's an interesting question. It's an interesting question because I believe it could like if Alice if uh, if Alice is uh, from the SR two five five one nine and uh, the dest the destination is from the SM two I believe it still work in sub XT and uh, but here like when you like when you signed in extrinsic or a signature uh, onto the chain and I believe. It will it 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 will signing uh, it 
the message we assigned with the SR2 5519 algorithm. <coughs> mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Bless you. Sounds good. Okay, cool. Is there more that you want to show us, Maggie, or should we open it up for questions? Or what I think I think the I think that's all I want to show to today. Yeah, awesome. That's that's really great. I'm really happy that you came on. And I had even before I don't remember when you first contacted me, like a few weeks ago, and I had it on my to do list for quite a while, like figure out how to add some <laughs> new crypto schemes into Substrate and. I honestly, I hadn't even started it because I was like a little bit intimidated by it and I thought it would be pretty hard. And so I'm really happy that you showed us how to do it. And then like, as a bonus, I've also been wondering how sub XT works for a while. So you even showed us that. So yeah, this was, this was great. Very okay. interesting. Yeah. So, uh, I have a question I, actually. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I missed the beginning of your presentation, um, but it looked really good. Um, we implemented SodaLite on um, on our project um, as a, um, a a sort of public key store, and um, one of the sort of questions that we had, and it's still kind of unanswered really, is that um, we were able to generate, um, for example, ephemeral keys in the runtime, and then as as we were doing this, we kind of wondered, what well, is that a safe practice? To do that, I mean, um, in, in this case, what we were doing is generating an ephemeral secret key in order to uh, encrypt um, data for a particular recipient. And I think I came in just at the point where I was looking at some stuff where you were generating keys in inside your um, sort of runtime modules as well. I, I don't know if if I saw that correctly or not. But it's kind of a general security question, really. Is it is it safe? Has anybody sort of thought about, is it safe to generate this on the runtime? It's not safe. Yeah, you, <laughs> if, you have, if you have private keys in your runtime, then it means that every node in the network knows those keys. So like anyone who runs a node will be able to, well, I mean, they're literally signing the data, I guess, if you're doing the signing. Yeah. But, but in terms of generating on the fly and then throwing away, as you're running, as you're running it. So an ephemeral key is used not to be stored anyway. You don't store it, you just generate it as a one-time key. I'm just wondering how um, how somebody would inspect the goings-on in the runtime to actually capture that key and whether it would be possible to do that. Hmm. What it, can you tell us more about your use case, Chris? Or like what do you do with the key when you have it? Yeah, so so basically, um, we were creating a, a storage for um, something like PGP keys, but it's basically the, the, a public key storage for a given user. And in order to validate that user, what we were thinking of doing was generating a random piece of information and then encrypting it for that user and storing it against their name. And only they would be able to decrypt that data. So we used uh, a key, um, just a key pair uh, um, in, in fact, uh, uh, basically soda light, you're, you're able to, to generate um, a key on the fly and, and use the public key of the person that you're, you're wanting to send this to. Um, so you encrypt this data and you store the encrypted data within storage, but only the person who's sent, who's claiming that key, could read that storage. Um, and the, the idea was that they decrypt it and then send it back to the uh, to the runtime, and the runtime performs the same result, the same operation again, in order to confirm that this is uh, indeed the person that um, is claiming this key. So, uh, it's see, my, I mean, anyone can speak up. My instinct is that it's, it's not quite secure, but I, I almost even think there's a problem before it. Like if you have information inside your runtime, that's ultimately intended just for one recipient, like even apart from whether it got encrypted securely, one, if that infers any, any information that's in the runtime is known to anyone who's running a node in the network. So like, you know, if let's say I'm malicious and I want to, 
like extract some of the secret information from your network. I just modify my node slightly so that, or, you know, it's even like really slight. I just put in like a, you know, print line and then print like whatever that piece of information is that doesn't affect the chain state at all. So like I still come to consensus and sync the chain and everything, but now all these secrets are flowing out my node log. But okay. if I understand Chris, Chris correctly, they are generating the, the key, the secret are, is generated in memory, in the WASM memory. So it's, it, it, was that correct, Chris? Yeah, it would be generated, well, in the runtime, yeah, either in WASM or in the um, native runtime. So each node on the network would generate their own secret, or a unique one at least. Yes, that's right. They would they would each generate their own unique um, secret because it was dependent on a number of factors that would be unique to each node. And in that case, it, it would be, you know, just as secure slash unsecure as any piece of memory running on a, any computer, I guess. So well, that so, was the question, really. Has, has right, anybody right. sort of explored that in terms of substrate? I, I don't have I don't have any substrate specific knowledge, knowledge about what what protections are in place for the the live memory of the WASM execution engine. Um, I don't think it's encrypted at all, um, and you would have to probably run it inside something like an enclave, uh, the SGX stuff, or the AMD equivalent. Yeah, okay. So my next question is like if. I did not understand like each node will generate a key pair and they won't all generate the same key pair. So I guess then my question is like, so once you're in this state where you're executing your runtime logic and every node has used some like real randomness to, well, I mean, first of all, where did the randomness come from? Like, how did you generate the key? And then once you're in this situation where every node has a different key that it, you know, thinks of as like the key that it generated, then, how are you going to end up reaching consensus on like whatever uh, that function call does? Like if it writes to storage or emits an event or something like each node would get a different result there because they had a different key. Right, I guess, uh, but, but all, but only the certain nodes would, would validate the information. Is that correct? I mean, it, there's only one block producer at any one time, isn't there? So it would be the block producer that, um, that determines actually what's stored, how, however that consensus is arrived at. Yeah, right. Yeah, I agree with that. So the block producer will like, you know, author the block and come up with some like, okay, you know, I'm writing this value to storage. For sure the block author comes up with that. But then like, let's say it's me and I authored that block. And so now I gossip it around to all the rest of you guys. So then like when Hernando goes to verify it, he has to be able to answer the question like, is this value that Joshi put in this storage correct? Like, do I get the same result? All right, okay. It's not just a, a, a general acceptance of, of what was put in that storage as being correct provided it, it meets Yeah, it has the to be re-executed on each node. It's, it's okay. actually, it's like a pretty interesting problem. I'm, I would, is your, is the code you're asking about like public? Could we look at it? At, I mean, not, we don't have time to do it all together right now, but like, I'd love to study from it. So I was just trying to look it up on a second screen over here. So, yeah. uh, so I'll post the, the, the link in the chat. Yeah, cool. That sounds good. Yeah, I guess like one thing that was coming to mind, I, I know what, what Maggie did here, which is a sort of standard procedure is like verified signatures in the runtime. So like, I, I think you said you came in right at this part where she was talking about it, Chris, but she had this runtime interface yeah. that like just did the, the verification and then the signing all happened off chain and it was just like signatures that were sent into the chain. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, okay, cool. Well, I guess, uh, I guess we can wrap here today. This, for me, this was a really, really, oh yeah, uh, Jordan, were you raising your hand? Did you have a question or? Yeah, is it okay to ask some questions? Yeah, oh yeah, for sure, yeah. Cool. Um, so for Maggie, I was wondering, like it's kind of a two-parter, how did you get started working at Parity and um, why did you make the shift from uh, being an ETH developer to working with Parity? Uh... Sorry, the sound is a little blur, and can you like to see that again? Yeah, no problem. Um, so the question was, how did you start working at Parity, 
And why did you make the shift from working with ETH um, to work with Parity? Oh, how I start with working Parity. And uh, I think I, I, I'm kind of interested. I was kind of interested in Substrate and I learned Substrate for my, uh, by myself, maybe for a couple of months. And, and uh, I just applied the job. Cool. So you, you just like you look, wanted to work at Parity, so you applied and, and you got it. That's awesome. Um, so the second part of that is why did you make the shift from, you said you were a, an ETH developer. Why did you make the shift um, from working with ETH to working at Parity? Ah. Okay, okay. That's, I think that's a, that's a really great question because uh, when I, like when I uh, worked on the like depth on the ETH, and uh, so uh, there are some there are some problems I met, and one is uh, the gas fee, and uh, the cost of signing uh, a transaction is really really high. Like uh, I was working on like an an an, an, uh, an NFT protocol or a game on the on the East use a smart contract. And uh, like all the project, like it contains maybe about a hundred smart contracts that each of them maybe need to uh, interact with each other. So it's really big. It's a really big project in, in the, uh, with the smart contract. Uh, so the, like the, if you send a transaction like to a core, to call a function in the smart contract and it always like it always will like recursively call maybe call five or four smart contracts function and it's really cost it's uh, it's really costly uh, in the east so and uh, the other one is the uh, is a transaction i think uh, it's a traffic uh, sometimes the traffic on the east is really uh, is really terrible and uh, the third is when I uh, when I uh, uh, when I developing with the smart contract and the all the and all the smart contract things it's very hard to upgrade. I need to use a very complicated uh, proxy uh, proxy module to upgrade one smart contract, and it's really and I think it, uh, the, the upgrade process is really complicated and. Uh, and uh, at last, uh, I really enjoy I really enjoy the community of the e of the, of the Ethereum. It always comes up with very interesting and new and inspiring project. But when I want to do further, and when I want to do like uh, I want to like to dig deeper in the blockchain development, I don't want to uh, only write some depths on the top of some blockchain like i want to custom uh i want to the cust uh, i want to custom the native blockchain and uh, i really like to hit the wall in the ethereum so that's the reason i trans like i switch to the substrate that that is awesome thank you for sharing all of that um lots of reasons then basically so that's great um i have a couple more questions if you have some more time uh, it's more of like a like a kind of future thinking question. In um, I remember seeing like a like electric curve cryptography is relatively new, as I understand it. Um, but like, is there already kind of steps on like the next kind of paradigm? Is there like what's what is on the horizon of cryptography? Um, and is or is elliptic curve cryptography kind of like the pinnacle? Is like we're not going any further. Than that? Ah, I think it's really an expert question, you know, because I I'm also new to I'm also new to the crypto uh, crypto system, so uh, I might not able to like to predict the future of the elliptic curve. I'm sorry. That's fine. It was it was a an odd question for sure. Um, last question I have is what is elliptic curve cryptography used outside of crypto? Oh, what's the quick curve? I I believe maybe point to point community communication communication. Yeah, some chat apps. 
Yeah, like Signal Signal's a good example. Basically, like anytime I want to send you, uh, yeah. I don't want, uh, you know, any of these other people eavesdropping on it. Right. Most browsers and web servers are going to be using elliptic curve cryptography too. Sorry, could you say that again? Most web browsers and web servers are going to negotiate, prefer to use elliptic curve cryptography for TLS and HTTPS connections. So we're using it every day, all the time. Amazing. Joran, I wondered if you wanted to introduce yourself a little bit. It's great to have you at the seminar. I don't think I've seen you here before. Yeah, no, this is my first time. Um, I kind of stumbled across Polkadot and Kusama in, in like the past month. Um, just being in quarantine, like been studying as much as I possibly can. And so, um, yeah, I was really intrigued by the Polkadot project. And I've just been like kind of digging through and trying to learn as much as I can. I was on, um, like I applied for the, uh, the Polkadot ambassador program and was on a couple of those calls. And in, in those calls, they mentioned this seminar. So I thought it was just, uh, yeah, just to dive kind of headlong into the, the fray and to, uh, to see what it's all about. So that's what kind of brought me here. Um, I'm a web developer by training and I want to get more into the blockchain space. Um, yeah, and I, I want to build, so I want to, I want to learn. Yeah, cool, that's awesome. I, I didn't remember it until you said this, but uh, Hutch from Web3 Foundation mentioned that there were a couple guys Maybe you're one of them who he was recommending should come to a seminar. So yeah. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Welcome. If you're a web dev by trade, you, you might be interested in seeing, we didn't actually do this today. Maggie used sub XT, but most of the time people use polka.js for submitting extrinsic. So if you haven't seen that, that might be a good place for a web guy to, to dive in. Yeah. I, uh, I haven't taken a look at it, but yeah, it's definitely on my list of uh, things to read through. And Mangi, I have one last question. When you play around with the source code, with the Git, uh, with the repository that you have, uh, oh, so okay. You, okay. you run one node or more than one node? Uh, I think you can run as many nodes as you can, as you want. For your demo that you did today, you ran one node, I think, right? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. For my yeah, demo for, today, yeah, yeah. I just wrong. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, bye everybody. See you next time. Bye. See you. Bye. Hey, bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Thanks.